Well hey friends, it is October and that means it is time for the October update of the Life Giving Home book by Sarah and Sally Clarkson. I love October. <laughs> it's my absolute favorite month. Um, my husband and I were married in October. We just had our nine year wedding anniversary on the 13th. Um, I just, I love everything about this month. Probably likely because it's fall and just this beautiful transition and the outdoors is beautiful with the leaves and oh, I just love it. So I was really looking forward to this chapter. I found that um, for my own self, I felt like it was very long and so it's taken me a lot longer to really um, work through it and digest it and sink it deep into my heart. Um, and so that's I guess why the video is coming a bit later to you in the um, mid-month, uh, if you will, kind of closer towards the end. Um, there just was a lot to go through and I don't know if maybe I was just needing some of the words and wisdom that was shared here more than ever, um, especially in this particular season in my life. So what I'm going to do with this chapter is I'm going to break it down into two parts. We're going to have the first video, which is today, and then I will have a second part. Uh, the first part of the video, I'm going to just talk about the opening of... Um, of the chapter, uh, the October chapter, and share with you some thoughts, um, things that are running through my heart and my head, and give you some, um, just some words of encouragement. And then in the second video, we'll go through some of the more practical things that uh, Sally and uh, Sally and Sarah do within their home to celebrate and um, create a life giving home for the month of October. So we are in a very busy season of life here within our home, um, and I don't use that term loosely. I actually hate the term and the idea of being busy. Um, it causes me a lot of stress. I'm not somebody who thrives on busy. Um, I am a slow-mo kind of girl. Um, I love to never leave my house. <laughs> um, I Just the idea of going all the time is an aversion to me. I just, I can't do it. Um, and so we are in a busy season of life and it's been tough for me. Um, the stress of all that was really wearing on me the other night and I was just, my house was feeling um, overwhelming like with a lot of stuff, like laundry had been piling up and um, just the house projects weren't getting done, a whole bunch of stuff, just things, right? And I went to go make my bed at like 10.30 at night, I just started to cry because I felt very overwhelmed in this season and I felt um, like a maid. I felt like no one was really appreciating what I was doing and I thought, why am I even bothering? Like, my children could care less. They're two and five. They don't know. They have no idea, like, anything that I'm really trying to do for them. As long as they are have food and some toys to play with, they're happy and fine. Um, and my husband doesn't really care all that much either, to be perfectly honest. And I thought, why am I striving? Why am I doing this? Um, and I just I started to cry and um, got into bed and I pulled out my life-giving home book. And I thought, why am I even reading this right now? This is not where my heart is. This is not where my mind is. And in that moment, I just felt like all the more that I needed to read it. And I had already begun the chapter, like I had already read uh, part of what I was um, going to reread, but it, the words just jumped out at me all the more. And it brought me back to a sense of, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it reaffirmed to me so much that homemaking just doesn't happen when life is feeling rosy and good and that homemaking and life giving happens even in the midst of weariness and um, I just want to encourage those of you who are watching this series um, and maybe you just tuned into this video for the first time I want to encourage you that if it feels like you are in a really difficult season of life whatever that looks like for you um, whether you feel like your family cares or doesn't care and if you feel like creating a life-giving home for your family is difficult and overwhelming and um, 
like you feel like nobody cares I just really want to encourage you in that in that space that you feel that you are walking from and living from and that is kind of overwhelming to you let me just encourage you that you are not alone and that this book is meant for you there is so much in here that I think can speak to us even if we don't have the ideal picture of what we think that a life-giving home should be. I guess when I think of it, what comes to my mind is um, happy, joyful kids, a bright, thriving, wonderful marriage, um, an atmosphere of joy and um, that you know you, everyone works as a team um, and it's a good place to be. And that for me is always the goal. However, we are human and I fall apart more times in a day than I care to admit. And um, I don't hit that bar. Um, and just reading the beginning of this chapter reminded me so much that I don't do this alone and I don't have to do it alone. That I do have the strength of the Holy Spirit, that I can rely on God to work through me and to minister to me as I'm ministering to my family. I'm going to read a little bit from this book because I feel like Sally created such a beautiful picture of, um, of Jesus serving his disciples and doing that in the midst of weariness and imparting really what she said, and I agree with her, are some of the most challenging words of the Bible as Jesus's final instructions to his disciples. And those are things that, you know, we are called to live out as well. And um, just embodying that into our role as the woman, as the homemaker, as the life giver of our family. Um, and to see how Jesus modeled that is just incredible. So I'm going to flip open to the book and um, read you a couple things. Okay, so this is on page 193, um, and the chapter is called Home is Best, Serving Life Within Your Walls. So she provides a picture, um, a model for serving, and as you can see, I kind of underlined it and starred it because I wanted to remind myself that this is so important. I'm not going to read all of it, but her picture... Um, is just a picture of uh, the people of Jerusalem um, preparing for the Sabbath and she describes the noises and the sounds and the scents and um, there she's talking about how they're preparing for um, the upcoming Passover celebration um, and she says but Jesus knew this would not just be any Passover he had carefully planned this last night before his death the last meal he would share with the ones he most wanted to understand his kingdom messages he had chosen a suitable place to imprint these profound messages into their hearts and minds forever. An upper room, a place of privacy where he could enjoy his closest trusted companions without interruption, and he had sent two disciples to go prepare the feast. From the beginning of time he had planned this night, the picture of the fulfillment of the Passover lamb, so treasured in the history, tradition, and hearts of all Jewish believers. He would fulfill Isaiah's prophecy as the true Passover lamb in their midst. Thinking about that evening, knowing that Jesus too was weary when he served most generously, has given me strength on many a demanding night. And then she goes to describe um, his preparations and how he had been, you know, preparing for the disciples and the the bitter herbs and the um, as they prepared. Um, prepared the succulent roasted lamb paired with the best wine so that Jesus's profound last words would fall upon men satiated with delectable tastes in the atmosphere and beauty of a prepared place. And I love this statement so much. I have to think that the God who prepared a garden of such beauty at the beginning had also put thought into preparing the place of the Last Supper with an eye for comfort, beauty, and hospitality towards those he loved most and I oh, just the very picture of that just hits my heart so much and um, because I guess sometimes I can read the Bible or read um, you know Bible stories like the Passover I've heard it a thousand times 
but I never thought about the scents and the um, atmosphere and the sounds and just putting myself into that place and imagining what those preparations looked like. And when we think about how we prepare for the holidays and for feasts and things like that, and some of us prepare like months and weeks ahead of time. And to imagine how Jesus must have prepared this very special final supper for the people that he loved most just is like so overwhelming to me and that he did all of this in the midst of the wearing fact knowing that he was heading to the cross and that he would bear the sins of the world. I mean, it's wild. And later he goes on to wash his disciples' feet, one of the most humble acts that he could do. So here's what Sally has to say about uh, Jesus washing his disciples' feet. She says, he knew as well that his own would be bewildered by the traumatic night. So willingly, generously, intentionally, he knelt down on the rough, sandy tile, girded himself with a towel, and gently and lovingly wiped the dust off his beloved's dirty, stinky feet, all the while speaking in soothing tones, teaching one last bit of wisdom. In the context of this display of servant love and in gentle consideration of the body and the soul fatigue of his own dear disciples, he spoke his most ardent, life-giving words. Love one another, John 13, 34. The helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you, John 14, 26. And in this world you will have tribulation, but take courage, John 16, 33. Always his heart and words were focused on his beloved band of friends. Always he was thinking of how to prepare them to strengthen them. Not even in his death did he focus on his own needs. He did all of this for those who could not comprehend his coming sacrifice. The depth of his choice to humble himself, or the vast generosity that was being expended from a heart overflowing with love for them. Only much later would, they under, would their understanding drawn, draw, dawn. Uh, understanding dawn. Learn from me, Jesus said, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Matthew eleven twenty nine. And then this next section is what um, just really hit me hard. Like I have this, you know, all underlined um, because I need to remember this. And I want to just kind of type this out and put it in like my home management binder so I can reread this stuff um, and let it sink in because I know that gosh, probably later today I'm going to feel weary and overworked and um, like I'm not making any sort of difference at all. But um, but seeing Jesus' example in serving and in loving uh, his disciples encourages me. So Sally says, and so in pondering, I must ask myself, does my heart remain humble as I serve my family in our home? As I wash dishes, plan a meal, clean a toilet, are my words life-giving and generous, serving to strengthen those who share my home? Is my heart like the heart of Jesus, always on those I serve? Do I bow willingly in the dust and stink? Do I bow willingly in the dust and stink of my own life because he was so willing to spend his life in giving, serving, loving, without thought of himself? even as he approached his death. I don't know, y'all, that just hits my heart so very much. Um, I feel like this, you know, these few paragraphs, like this few pages here, just impacted me so very much. Um, so I just want those words to really encourage you as you go about this journey of creating a life-giving home for your family, especially if you are just in a season or point of life where it is tough. I know for me, some seasons are way easier than others when things are going well and um, we're all happy and good and we're not dealing with attitudes and tantrums and all the hosts of craziness that goes on with life. When life is easy and good, yeah, homemaking is fun and simple and Creating a life-giving space is a-okay, but when life is tough, and I mean, let's be honest, that is, that's a little, sometimes a little more often than not, um, 
It is these words and the picture of Jesus serving in the midst of utter weariness, serving those who will be weary, his disciples. It's that very picture that reminds me that he knows what I'm walking through. He's, he knows it. And um, what he was enduring and knowing would be coming is way bigger than, than my, um, my whatever I'm going through. My, knowing that Jesus walked in weariness and he served and he gave of, his, of himself completely and fully to that gives me the strength to continue on in my journey as a wife, as a mom, as a homemaker, as a friend, as someone who wants to practice and offer hospitality to others. So in closing, I'll just leave you with um, the last paragraph that she wrote in this particular part of the section. She says, A truth told without love and grace is a truth that is rejected. Would Jesus' message have had the same impact without his feeding thousands and taking children into his arms and watching the feet of his friends? It is in service that God incarnate is recognized. And service begins with serving those who are closest to us, making home the very best place to be. So we'll leave it there. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts on this particular portion of the chapter. The next video will be more practical steps about how you can implement uh, serving your family and those who enter your home uh, into real life practice. So we'll give you some practical tips from the book. I hope you guys have a really great day and feel free to leave your comments down below. I'd love to know your thoughts. Thank you for hanging out with me today and just want to encourage you in your wearying days that you can do this. Um, you can do this. I'll be praying for you guys, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk with you soon.